So, I got some stale ass popcorn. And I just forgot to throw it away. Let's see if it tastes good. Hold on. It's just, it was just been like sitting up. Let me see. That was mercy. That was mostly a kernel. Hold on. Hold on. I see the seasons, but hold on. It's still good. It's still busting. Hold on. Hold on now. Ain't nothing in here though, like. It's just crumbs though. Oh man. Let's go. <laughs> ain't, ain't shit in here. Sup though. Working opening, but Singleton brings it away for Bradford. He's only had his him at the moment though, and he's played it straight to Redford. Saturday, May 11th, 1985. I can't do soccer or football. Or American football. I can't do nothing with contact. You ever see them football players? Like the American football players get hit? It's like you, you it's like you get hit one good time and it's rats for your whole life. And that's and they don't even get paid that much compared to like other sports. Even with uh soccer, like or or football, sorry. You know, I've been seeing some of them, they, they be playing dirty as hell. Like one day, one time I seen like a ball in the air and somebody was jumping up for a like I I think it's called a headbutt where they like, they hit the ball with their head, but, like, somebody else, it was, like, two people doing the same thing, going head first for the ball. And they hit each other. Oh, my God. Let me get clucked up in the sport. Sp cluck that sportsmanship. Cluck that good Samaritan shit. If I get clucked up, whether it was an accident on purpose... I'm clucking you up on site. A soccer match is underway in Bradford, West Yorkshire, England, between the visiting team Lincoln City and the home team Bradford City, a group riding the high of having just won their divisional championship in the week prior. This was the season finale for the club, one last match for the team and the fans to cap off what was otherwise a historic run. However, it wasn't just the season that this game would mark the end of. At the time, Bradford City played their matches at a site called Valley Parade Stadium, with the facilities growing a reputation around the league as being incredibly outdated, and to many, downright neglected. The awnings that stretched over the fans were made of old rotted wood, while underneath the stands were heaps of old trash that would pile up all throughout the seat. That's dirty. That's nasty. That's dirty as hell. You dirty. Don't. That's nasty. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. Don't communicate nothing with me. Go ahead and unsubscribe. Don't, you know, don't call yourself a fan of mine. That's nasty. That's nasty. That's nasty. And, and rarely, if ever, be cleaned. The whole place was a mess, and the city knew it too, which eventually led to their decision to just rebuild the stadium completely, with plans being set to tear the whole thing down soon after the game would end. But as it turns out, fate wasn't willing to wait quite that long. That's nasty. Within the stands, a spectator was watching on, enjoying a cigarette, taking one last drag before flicking it out of his hands. I still locked intently on the game, failing to notice that the cigarette butt had slipped through the floorboards of the bleacher and landed on the ground below. Oh God! This almost immediately caused a small fire to break out, which was noted by the commentator, John Helm. We've actually got a fire in the stand on the far side of the ground. And oh my God! Very nasty indeed. Despite the cigarette only being dropped a minute or so before, the fire was already visible from the stands. As within that old stadium, I bet the, I bet, I bet like the little gas or whatever that ignited it, that that ignited the fire was like, was like, I don't know, like let's say it was like lighter fluid or something. I bet the lighter fluid was like, come on, baby, come on, I smell it, come on, drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. Oh! <laughs> was the perfect makings of a disaster. 
When that cigarette fell to the ground, it didn't just land on the grass. Because the grass was likely not even visible at that point, and was buried under mounds and mounds of garbage. That's garbage nice. that acted as the perfect kindling for the blaze. And that wasn't all. Remember, one of the main sticking points of the rebuild was the fact that the awnings that reached above the fans were made entirely of that old wood. Meaning that you had heaps of kindling, tons of wood, and now a spark. With the final fatal factor being that it was a windy day, it was the perfect storm. And the results were devastating. That one person caused all that harm. God damn. That one person. Can you imagine being that one person that did all that? God. That once that's what I'm talking about, bro. Like that once that it makes me so nervous. You ever be driving and like be behind somebody and somebody flicks out a cigarette, but like when they flick it out, it like it like has like a little sparkle on the ground. That makes me nervous. I hate it when somebody um flicks out a cigarette like in the woods or in the forest, like in the backyard. That makes me nervous. It's like that one tiny ass cigarette can start a fire for models. That one person caused all that. <laughs> can you imagine? Everybody figuring out it was that one person. It was just like, <laughs> it just started fighting. <laughs> it just started fighting him. The black ball of smoke is rising hundreds of feet in the air. Whoa! That one cigarette, bro! Shit! It took approximately three minutes for that small fire to engulf the entirety of the stands. As the black smoke billowed into the sky, and the crowd desperately rushed to the field to get away from the heat. It's hot as hell. And the whole place is scorching! Why is he still narrating? He should be the hate. <laughs> I just realized that. Why is he still there? Why is he still working? Get the hell out of there, man. All right. That's, it's on you. It's your funeral. Why are you still there? It's like... It's like that one scene from The Legend of Korra. I think the first, from the first season where it's like... I forgot what they're called. But like the bad guys with the electricity. They, uh, they raided the... Um, they raided the, what's the name? It was like a game going on with like Cor and her crew. And like, they was like, you know what I mean? Um, that little game that they throw like the water, like the, like the bending and the elements and stuff. And the electricity people raided them. And like, one of the bad guys got into the booth. With the narrator, and he was like, he was narrating his own clock. One of them is in the booth with me right now, folks. He is leveling one of those glove devices at me now, and I believe he is about to electrocute me. I am currently wetting my pants. They've been talking about having a new ground at Valley Parade. They might soon have to have one. Because this is the day that Valley Parade Football Club, the football ground, is burning down. The footage is highly disturbing, so much so that I can't show the entire thing. But during this time, however, a radio broadcast was on air, with the audio giving us a good idea of just how chaotic the scene was, and the moments when the blaze really erupted. And we've on fire here at Valley Parade. The whole end of the stand at one side is actually in flames. Now I can see the orange of the flames. It's actually insane that you're still right here. You're still there narrating the whole thing. It's like nobody, it's like everybody's just in one spot. I would have left so clucking fast. The game is actually stopped here at Valley Parade. And people are running around. They're running around beside us. They're running around all around us. And people are saying, get onto that pit. The whole stand is on fire, Tony. It's an absolute. It's spreading quickly. There's going to be there's going to be problems, Tony. Let's get all those people out of Who's there. Tony? Let's get those people. Just take your time. Don't rush. Don't push. Wait for the kiddies. People are coming around us. You can hear them. Don't rush. Don't. What do you mean? Please rush. Get the hell out of there. Every person for themselves. 
Caught them kitties. The smoke coming everywhere. We are going to have to disconnect very shortly because it really is flaming all the time. We're taking a break. We're getting out of it. In the stands that day were approximately 6,000 people, and based on the footage, many of whom were able to run to safety very quickly, which gave a sense of hope that the ordeal might end in minimal casualties. Though there was another side of things. Those who chose not to run towards the field opted to go the opposite way, as there was an entrance and exit located directly behind the stands where the fire had started. And when the crowd managed to make their way to this exit, they were met with a disturbing revelation. The gates were shut. God damn! And those that were open or busted open were also blocked by slow-moving turnstiles, some of which being locked themselves. And as the crowd began pushing more and more to get through these turnstiles, it in turn led to a crush of humanity, with everyone piling on top of one another as the fire slowly consumed them. When the smoke cleared and the bodies were counted, 56 had tragically lost their lives, while another 265 were left with serious injuries, with a tragedy leading to numerous new safety That's steps. That's your fault. That's your fault. That's your fault. Y'all want to just stay there like, bro, I would have left so damn fast. Damn. It's for soccer stadiums across the country as Valley Parade's notoriously bad reputation had finally caught up with it on its very last day. And then, and then now it sucks because it's like, if he, even if you build something on top of this, like a new stadium or whatever you build on top of this, it's going to be haunted by those 56 people that lost their lives. Marking one of the deadliest days in the world of soccer and one of the darkest moments in television. History. That was so dramatic. The bodies are being dragged away from that stage. That recorded the man's actions as he was taking a special yeah, program. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Before we dive into our next case here. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. Hey, kids and parents. Get two parents. You remember when. The world of television. Is no stranger to death defying stunts. From the very beginning of broadcasting, viewers have been captivated by the sight of people risking their lives to pull off these seemingly impossible spectacles. But while most of these performances are done by trained professionals, perhaps one of the strangest television stunts ever performed was one done by a man with hardly any training at all, Adelir Antonio de Carli. Born in Pelotas, Brazil, Adelir felt a calling early in his life to dedicate himself to God. This eventually led to him becoming a Catholic priest where he developed a deep connection with those in his community. To many, Adelir was considered a man of the people, someone who had a passion for religion and a goal to make it accessible to as many people as possible, which is where he developed the idea for his most infamous project. Near his home in Brazil was a popular port city named Paranagua, which saw the import and export of a vast array of goods, making it a central hub for truckers to drive to and from on a regular basis. But Adelir began to realize that for these truckers, the vast majority of their lives were lived on the road, and this rarely, if ever, allowed them to practice their religion. This revelation inspired Adelir to start putting together plans to build a chapel at a trucker's rest stop right in Paranagua, which would allow for drivers to stop and worship while on the road. In theory, this seemed like a great idea, and one that the community could easily rally behind, though there was just one issue, the money. Building a chapel and maintaining it was not going to be cheap, and far exceeded what was possible with just his salary, making the whole thing seem like more of a dream than anything, unless he could somehow find a way to raise the funds. Which is when he had the idea. He was going to create a public spectacle, one where he would attach himself to hundreds of helium-filled balloons and take off into the sky in a process known as balloon clustering. Believe it or not, this was actually a somewhat well-known stunt at the time, as popularized by a man named John Ninomia, whose footage was shown on numerous television stations a few years prior. Does this have anything to do with the movie Up? I've never seen it, 
but I just want to know because I've seen like images of like a house of like this old guy, this old white guy in this house with hella balloons just floating up. I don't know what that's about, but that's, that's is there any correlation with that or is this just, or is this just like its own little thing? I mean. In 2006, and perhaps having been inspired by this, Adelir viewed the stunt as the perfect opportunity to fund his chapel, oh my God. with his plan being to break the world record of 19 hours in the air, and in doing so, use the publicity to gather donations. What? But the only problem was, he had no experience whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. also, those aren't Adidas balloons. <laughs> They're not, they probably like some off-brand shit called Adidas gone skydiving numerous times before though and he believed that his familiarity with that would help him to break the record in no time oh yeah and so on january 13th 2008 in the city of umperi brazil over 600 balloons were filled with helium and attached to a chair which adelir was then strapped to how do you get he began down? to lift off the ground quickly floating high in the sky as the news cameras were there to film it all how do you get down the flight saw him travel roughly 17 miles and reach an altitude of 17,000 feet Shit. highlighting just how dangerous of a stunt this really was but despite his lack of experience after around four hours he would touch down safely in argentina oh. marking the end of his first successful flight it was a promising start and inspired Adelir to continue planning and prepping I for- I thought he was gonna be in, a, in the, um, I thought he was gonna be in the sky continuously for like 19 hours, okay. Next attempt, which he resoundingly told people would break the world record. In preparation for doing so, he took part in various jungle survival training exercises Jesus. and even took up mountain climbing as he knew he would be flying over remote regions which left him at risk of being stranded somewhere in the wilderness. To further aid in this, Adelir would also have a satellite phone and a GPS, which he would use in tandem to help track his location and call for assistance should things go awry. It seemed that Adelir was ready for anything. But on April 20th, 2008, as a crowd gathered around to see this man attempt this record, the weather began to take a turn for the worst. During his first flight, the skies were sunny and the winds were calm, but on this day, it was gloomy and the rain was falling hard off and on, putting the whole stunt in jeopardy. But Adelir remained confident, boasting that thanks to God he would have perfect weather when he was on his flight. Porque eu vou subir acima dela. Dez minutos eu ultrapasso ela. E depois vou voar sempre em tempo bom. And despite some trying to convince him to push things back, he knew that the crowd was there for him, and this was his chance to secure funding for his dream project. Com essa quantidade de balões, o padre deve viajar a cerca de cinco mil metros de altitude. Com ele lá em cima, vão estar aí no telefone celular por satélite, GPS. Chegando a Dourados, no Mato Grosso do Sul. O tempo estava fechado, mas o padre insistiu em voltar. Era uma da tarde quando ele subiu, levado por mil balões de gás coloridos. Pretendia bater o recorde. E com isso, ele was off. Soaring quickly into the sky, where he eventually disappeared into those thick rain clouds. For essentially all of his flight, those clouds made it practically impossible to see the man which was further exasperated by the fact that this time he had used 1,000 balloons as opposed to 600, which brought him to an even higher elevation, this time touching almost 20,000 feet. But just because he was out of sight, that didn't mean that we couldn't hear from him, as he would soon call down to a local news station to share a somewhat concerning update. He's been for uh, two so they can teach so they can teach you something bro you man you going 20,000 feet in the sky you don't need you everything you need to be taught all your questions all your concerns need to be dealt with before you leave that ground Despite dedicating countless hours of training before the flight, there was one thing that Adelir had failed to prepare for, the GPS, as he was never shown how the device actually worked, wow. and he only realized that he had no idea how to operate it once he was already at his peak altitude, meaning that he was essentially flying blind. The course he had set out on was set to see him travel 400 miles inland to a city named Dorados, and by his prior calculations, the wind should have still been taking him at the very least in that direction, 
which for a moment gave him a sense of calm, as he trusted the preparation even if he didn't know his exact coordinates. But after a few hours, as the moon began to rise, so too did the panic within Adelir, as he caught a glimpse of a strange sight on the horizon. The ocean. I was going to say that, man. I was going I was thinking that, I was thinking that, like, like, what if, like, you, man, man, man. Damn. Somehow, the wind had done a complete 180 and had blown him in the exact opposite direction that he had prepared for. And before he knew it, he was flying directly over the sea with no way of stopping himself or even slowing himself down as he was now flying alone into pitch blackness. Adelir called his team and requested they send rescue, but there was no way to give his exact location. And by this point, he was already nearly 40 miles out to sea. The only good thing about that, him being in the ocean, God forbid he get eaten the hell up or he get hurt is, is that he gonna have those balloons on him. So it's like, it's not like he's floating or it's not like he doggy paddling, dog, doggy paddling, whatever it's called. It's not like he's using extra muscle or extra energy to keep him afloat. The balloons are doing it for him. Hopefully, best case scenario. After being just eight hours into his 20 hour flight, the ground team would lose contact with Adelir after receiving a message from him begging for his rescue and he would never be heard from again. Shit! Oh my God! Up, up, and away. A Catholic priest trying to break a record for most hours flying with helium-filled party balloons vanishes into thin air. The subsequent search for Adelir was broadcast heavily all across the world, with the media dubbing him as the Balloon Priest. And after nearly nine days of searching, the only sign of the man was his balloons. They were found detached and floating in the ocean, with there being no sign of the priest whatsoever, leaving his fate as a total mystery. At least at the time. On July 4th, 2008, a tugboat sailing off the coast of Mackay near an offshore oil rig would spot something floating in the water, and upon closer inspection, it would be identified as a body. Ah. Or at least part of one, given all that remained was the subject's lower half. And upon DNA testing, it was confirmed that it did in fact belong to Adelir Antonio de Carli, who likely crashed into the water and drowned, only to be picked away at by various predators of the ocean, thus ending the balloon priest's saga in a tragic, yet for many, unsurprising manner. Night is the most dangerous time for pedestrians along streets and highways. To be on the safe side, walk facing traffic and wear light-colored clothing for quicker recognition by approaching drivers. Or you can... What? what, what? And once you get into a, a car with somebody, uh, what? you're at their mercy. If Ooh. your car should become disabled, the rule of thumb is stay inside. There are signs you can get to put on the back window to it was the waning days of 1986. New station NBC7 San Diego records and broadcasts a PSA segment about safety on the roads, and specifically what to do if your car breaks down at night. This may seem like a fairly random topic, but for residents of San Diego, fears were rising over just how safe their highways were, as just a few days prior, a 20-year-old college student named Kara Knott had gone missing only for her car to be found pulled over onto the shoulder of a tall bridge, where underneath, police would find her body, having been strangled brutally and tossed over the side to the ground below. Understandably, residents were concerned, with many assuming that she had ran into car troubles and likely exited her vehicle to get help, only to be kidnapped and killed by a nearby motorist. Shit! And due to this, NBC7 thought this segment would be effective in educating those out there in the hopes of avoiding another situation like Kara's, especially considering at this point, her killer was still somewhere out there. For the video, they even had a highway patrol officer come out to share his tips. Uh, being a female, you could be robbed if you're a male, um, all the way to where you could be uh, killed. Uh, once you get in that other person's car, you're at their mercy. As well as a man whose car had broken down when they were filming. Do you realize how dangerous it is? Yes, I realize. In fact, I was putting the gas in, 
And uh, 18 Wheeler came by and almost blew me away. Overall, the segment appeared relatively harmless, with the main messaging being to contact authorities and wait for their assistance rather than trusting a stranger. But still, this did little to calm the public's nerves as paranoia rippled through the community and speculation began to run rampant on who was responsible for Kara's death, which is when disturbing allegations began to emerge. Following this report, 24 separate women would come forward to share their bizarre encounters that they had had on that very same road in which Kara was found. The girls claimed that they were pulled over by a police officer. 24. You would think, at the light, I don't know, the fourth, fifth one, they would have had security. They would have had officers just like patrolling that area. 24? That's insane. Interrogated them in their cars for upwards of two hours. God damn! And the questions being asked during this weren't even relevant to the alleged violations they had committed. Instead, they were more personal, sometimes even sexual as if the man was trying to seduce them. And it got stranger from there, as when looking into that cop's work record, it was discovered that he was on patrol the night in which Kara had gone missing, and he just so happened to be working that very same stretch of highway. And making things even more concerning was the fact that underneath Kara's fingernails were traces of what appeared to be fabric that matched the material used to make police uniforms. And hidden in the officer's trunk was heavy rope, with it eventually being revealed that Kara had rope marks around her neck, implying that that's how she was killed. But what does make these accounts so important and so relevant to the topic at hand was the fact that the officer being named by every single one of these women was a man named Craig Allen Pyre. Spotting pedestrians. Cut you! Now, once you get into a, a car with somebody, uh... You're at their mercy. Because if you do decide to walk, the CHP says you never know who you may meet along the road. I'm saying. Anything could happen. The very Craig. same officer that was shown in the local news report. Isn't his name Craig? It would eventually be revealed that on December 27th... Hold on, what's his name? Is his name Craig? Because I saw Craig at the bottom of the screen, so I don't know if that's him. Then let me find out his name is Craig. 86, Craig Allen Pyre pulled over. Goddamn Craig. Another reason to not trust nobody named Craig. Kara Knotts flirted with her, her, strangled her, and then threw her body off a bridge only two days later appear on this PSA and try and teach the public how to avoid being kidnapped and killed alongside of the highway. All the way to the way. <laughs> you would think how to not be kidnapped and killed, you would think people would know that. You know? Like, it would. you would think that would be common sense. How to teach somebody how not to get kidnapped and killed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just wear some, just wear anything Adidas, and you'll be all right. Be uh, killed. Uh, once you get in that other person's car, you're at their mercy. If strangers should offer assistance, right. tell them to call police or the CHP. Yeah, just stay in the vehicle, lock what all is the CHP? doors, uh, turn on the emergency flashers, uh, and wait for uh, help to come. It's so incredibly haunting to watch this segment back, especially considering what he's saying, knowing that he was quite literally the cause of the crime that inspired the segment to begin with. Thick ass cyber. Just two weeks after the program aired, Officer Craig Pyre would be arrested for the murder of Kara Knott, where he was eventually sentenced 25 years to life in prison. Just for one girl? Just for one woman? What about all the other 23 women? I don't know. Niagara Falls, Ontario. I don't know why that's why I was thinking Nigeria. Oh my god. I cannot read. <laughs> Canada. One of the most famous natural spectacles in the world. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> this is one of the most visually stunning locations in the United States, and even across the world, the three waterfalls that make up Niagara Falls offer a unique blend of beauty and violence, making it no wonder why tens of thousands of people visit the area every day 
just to take in the awe-inspiring views and that unbelievable rush of water. But on March 20th, 2003, as a typical crowd gathered to take their photos, their attention was captured by something far different than the scenery, something that couldn't have been possible. It looked like a man in the water. Oh no. Though he wasn't being swept over and he wasn't moving at all, he was just standing there at the very edge of the falls, staring off into oblivion. Police were immediately called to the scene as a panic arose, and within minutes, rescue crews would begin their work, along with a cameraman from a local news station. I'm not calling nobody. Oh my God. Oh my God. The footage shows what should have been an impossible scenario as an unnamed 48-year-old man was standing at the edge of the most powerful waterfall on the planet. Are you serious? Out of all these waterfalls in the world, Niagara Falls is the most powerful waterfall in the world. Oh my God. You got you standing right there. <laughs> if I was... <laughs> if I was God, I would have been like... Don't you call, if I, if I was God and he was trying to pray to me, I'd be like, don't you, don't you pray to me? Don't you call off of me? Don't you do nothing? Because that's some dumb shit you doing right now. Sorry. I'm just saying that, like, the don't, don't, like, don't ask me to protect you. Don't ask me to save you. Don't ask me to do none of that. Don't call out for me. You know, don't, don't, don't say my name in the slightest. I'm not helping you out whatsoever. You're a cluck ass, and I can't really help out with somebody that wants to be a... Nah, I can't do that. Sorry, player. I'm just going to watch from the heavens above. You doing some dumb shit like that, and if you get clucked up, you get clucked up. If you don't, then you don't. Like, I ain't no way I'm helping your ass. Sorry, not sorry. Why is it me? Yeah, I got so many questions, but for the sake of the video, I'm just not going to say them because the video is already long enough, but like, maybe he just want to get a, a better view, but regardless of the fact, I'm not the one that's going to call security. I'm not going to be the one that's going to notify the authorities. I'm not going to be the person. I'm just going to watch this shit till the end. Somehow staying balanced and remaining fully calm, despite being just one foot away from dropping over 180 feet to a certain depth. Unsure of how the man had ended up in the water, or how it was even possible for him to stay. I got a question. The water that's falling over the edge, right, in, the, in Niagara Falls, has it always been like that? Has it just always just continuously was water flowing, flowing? for all the time like has it always been like that or do we have the power to cut it off you know let me know in the comment section but like i just want to know if it's like if it's always been water flowing and if we have if we can just stop it or is it just like just a natural thing that happens Right. Rescue workers sprang into action with two men, Top Moriarty and Gary Carella, sliding into the water and attempting to walk towards him. But even for them, the current was just too much, forcing them to almost immediately turn back. You know what you can do? Maybe I'm just jumping the gun. But you know what you can do? Get a rope and get like, make it like a little circle or whatever. That's like man size. So like pretty much anybody can just you know, grab onto it or make make something, get something, get a helicopter and just dangle it down and mm, grab him. Or make him grab onto like the rope or some shit. I don't know. A man yelled to them that he was losing his strength and to not let him go over. To aid in the rescue, a helicopter was sent in to try and airlift the man up, but immediately the force of the rotors began to create strong gusts of wind leading to this. Now the man lay there, 
feet dangling over the edge of the falls, as the freezing cold water pelted him relentlessly. By this point, that man had already been in the water for over one hour. And how is he, if this is the most powerful waterfall in the world, how is he still there? Why hasn't the water just pushed him off the chits? Grip was slowly slipping. And so, in a last ditch prayer, a rescue worker inside the helicopter decided to toss a life preserver, knowing that this would likely be their final shot at saving him. And miraculously, the current caught it and brought it directly to him. With every bit of strength he had left, the man would let go of the rock he was clinging to and lunge towards the preserver, grabbing a hold of it as crews on shore began to pull him to safety. Or at least, they thought. As he was being towed to shore, the man approached what looked to be land, though in actuality this was an ice shelf that extended out over the water, meaning that the black line you see here isn't actually land, but instead a small opening between the sheet of ice and the water itself. Shit. And within that small opening, the rapids were raging at tenfold due to the increased pressure of the small size. And so while the man was being pulled towards rescue workers, he was almost immediately sucked underneath, pinning him in an immovable situation. Mariardi and Corella knew that they had to engage once again, or else the man was certainly going to drown, with their testimony later on showing just how dire the situation had become. He just told us, let me go. He just gave up. He said, save yourselves. Let me go. Let me go. But the rescue crews had come too far to just give up. And despite the pressure of the water becoming almost too much to bear, Corella slipped a harness around the man and gave the signal for the group to be lifted up. You got him? He good? After this, if he makes it out alive, he gotta do some sort of time. He gotta, he gotta, he gotta pay for some shit. Like, he gotta do community service. He gotta get locked up or something. Something, he, some sort of consequence. Somehow, they had all done the impossible. And with the victim now on solid ground, he was taken to a nearby hospital where despite suffering from severe hypothermia, he would go on to survive making it one of the most incredible rescues ever shown on television. But with the victim now safe, it was time to figure out what exactly had happened. Well, apparently, the man had lost all of his money due to a crippling gambling addiction, even gambling away the last of his family's own cash, losing everything and everyone in the process. And he entered the water that day, hoping to make it his last. Oh my God. But as he drifted towards the edge, he suddenly had a change of heart and decided to fight for survival. And somehow, when trying to stop himself, his foot became lodged in between. So, on your way to Niagara Falls, you thought it would be a good idea to just end everything. Right? But the second you got in the water, you was like, oh my God, this is a bad idea. Through rocks which also aided in shielding him from the rushing current, allowing him not only to stay there, but to stand upright. It's unknown what happened to the man from here, as he's understandably never been named publicly, but I do hope he managed to find some peace and purpose, as his story is one of very few of this nature with a happy ending, especially within Niagara Falls, as the area has become a hotspot for attempts just like this, the vast majority of which sadly end successfully. And as it turns out, one such example of this was captured when the cameras happened to be rolling. Larry Fraser that recorded the man's actions as he was taping a special program with Phil Cabot. It is Phil's voice you will hear on the tape. Factories, hotels, and other buildings line the river. As TV host Phil Cabot is recording a program for the local nightly news in Buffalo, New York, he did so near the mouth of Niagara Falls, where the rapids are raging in a particularly fearsome manner. When suddenly, buildings line the river. Then Frederick Olmsted started a campaign to persuade. We see a man come running from the brush and leap directly into the water. For obvious reasons, I can't show what happens next as the water begins to sweep the man towards the edge of the falls. But the audio alone is sufficient in showing just how traumatic the moment was for the news crews watching on. Factories, hotels, and other buildings line the river. Then, Frederick Olmsted started a campaign to persuade New York to buy the land. Oh, shit! Oh, my God! <laughs> Holy oh, shit! Oh, my God! Oh, my... Oh! Oh! 
As they watched in horror, the man was dragged to the edge and then swept directly off, Dang. going over head first, oh. standing no chance of survival. According to the report, the man was never identified and his body was never found, likely having been pinned by the impossible force of the water at the bottom. But what I find most chilling about this video is the fact that it's only seemingly been archived in this poor quality, which makes deciphering details about it incredibly difficult. However, there were many who watched the program on TV the day after, as the news station actually aired this footage for the world to see. And one particular account has haunted me since the moment I first read it. I remember seeing this when it was first broadcast. It freaked me the hell out. It wasn't a worn out videotape back then, and the image was a lot cleaner. The guy looked at the news crew and into the camera when they started yelling, creepy and sad as hell. Despite being known for its beauty, there is a dark side to this amazing location, and one that has become and likely will remain no stranger to the world of television. I wonder if they can take the rocks out the bottom of Niagara Falls. So just in case somebody, like, and it's just water. So just in case somebody decides they want to just, you know, jump over the edge, they have a better chance at surviving. Because it's like, you put, there's rocks at the bottom. So it's like, you already falling at a high rate, high, um, you're, you're already falling at a, at, at a, at a high altitude and you're going fast and there's rocks at the bottom. So it's like, you not going to survive that. If you do, God was on your side. But like, I wonder if they can just take the rocks out. So just in case somebody ever do some dumb shit like that ever again, they have a more chance of surviving uh, versus, you know, not. That's crazy. Man. Jesus Christ. Hey, this, where is it? This, this, the, the balloon, the balloons? The balloons? You got it. That was that was that was stupid. That was stupid. If you're gonna be high in the sky like that, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles up or hundreds of miles up in the sky, you need to you need to have every question that you ever going that you that you ever gonna have answered, and you're gonna have you're gonna need have your all your concerns be dealt with before you leave the sky, before you leave the ground. Because being 20,000 feet in the air and you all of a sudden have a question, that <laughs> that's not going to do you justice. And you landed in the ocean. You probably got eight in the hell up. Sir. Clock you and it'll sway sideburns. How are you going to do that to the 24 women? Jesus. And again, I want to see Niagara Falls, but like, if it's like, it don't seem like there's that many borders. <clears throat> Just like the with the Grand Canyon, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of safety measures when it's dealing with Niagara Falls. And by the grace of God, you can't. You, 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 you. I would like to know what happened to you after the fact, because that has to be some sort of consequence. You can't just. Like, be in the waters of Niagara Falls without it has. I feel like that has to be somewhat, somewhat of illegal. Like you can just be in in uh, Niagara Falls water without having consequences. Keep cool, keep classy, and I love you. Stay happy, my family.